I love ports, don't know if you noticed. While they can be so many things, they can essentially be demakes that still retain the heart of the original game, they could be enhanced affairs that come out a bit later on. Hell, they can be something that kinda stands on its own. It's all about the love and care shown to the project, usually in the face of limited resources and very limited time, especially back in the day. There's some ports we naturally see a lot of, from the arcade to the console, for example an 8-bit console to a 16-bit console, perhaps. From computer to console and the other way around is certainly an intriguing area, and today, well, we have a dark path. Two things that should be quite at odds with each other, even if it's for no real reason other than dramatic effect on my part. Ports from the famous microcomputers, the Spectrum and the C64, to the Nintendo Entertainment System? Something about that just seems weird. They're such opposites, after all. So different. These are the micros that stopped the NES in its tracks here in the UK. As such, these ports from Specky and C64 to NES are worth highlighting, mainly because they're not actually very common, and often the circumstances behind said ports are strange to say the least, resulting in oddities. A quick opening example. Here's the almighty Monty on the one for the C64, complete with Rob Hubbard's music. Now, Here's the title screen for Monty no Doki Doki Dai Dasu on the Famicom, complete with awesome NES rendition of the great tune. And yet the game is, um, completely different. It's not a Monty Mole game at all. It's a port of nothing except the original Monty on the One's title music, with perhaps the odd fleeting element from the original game. Why did Jalico do this? <laughs> Who even knows? Anyway, that is but one example of the sort of weirdness we may see here, and it's not just limited to Japanese companies either. We have 10 games to go through, and if I'm being honest, not many of them are good. Something about these games either always seems to get lost in translation from the micro to the NES, or the original just wasn't too good to begin with. Annoyingly, the best game that fits into this category, the absolutely fantastic port of Elite for the NES by Imagineer, is a game I've kinda of already covered extensively and can't really do again so soon. But here it is, just in case I get shouted at for forgetting it. Anyway, here's 10 more games, none of which are as good as Elite for the NES. But some of them aren't too bad, I suppose. They're certainly interesting. Unbelievably, much like the last video we did on arcade-only sequels, we're starting with Robocop 2. Why this game again? Now you wouldn't necessarily think of it, but Robocop 2 is a strange licensed property indeed that for some reason got lots of totally different games. To be precise, there are 5 unique Robocop 2 games. Most of them are by Ocean, meaning that there may be similarities here and there, but generally they're pretty different from each other. We have the excellent Data East Arcade game that we covered in the last video. We have a Spectrum game that's... Uh, kind of okay. I have a lot of nostalgia for it at least, although it's nowhere near the original Specky game. We have an Amiga and ST game that's also perfectly alright, even if it's nothing that's memorable. We have the Amstrad GX4000's killer app, a legitimately fantastic, if also very hard, platformer. And we have a C64 game that is, not to be too blunt about it, complete and utter unplayable crap. Guess which one of this litany of games got ported to the NES? Yes, of course it was the bloody C64 one, and if anything, it's even worse on the console. This is just such a bloody annoying game. As with most of the other Robocop 2 tie-ins, Ocean really put a lot more into platforming for this one, as opposed to the side-scrolling original. Suddenly, Robo can jump everywhere. But this game is by far the most annoying implementation of that, for whatever reason, Robocop has Mario-esque momentum, making every stage feel like it's on ice. Mario momentum works in games that are well designed for it, like, well, Mario, obviously. This just isn't at all. The design is so bloody frustrating, complete with random insta-death traps or bridges that aren't obviously broken. Just all the classic European bullshit. And that's not even the most bullshit thing. 
that would be having to collect a certain amount of nuke in each stage. If you don't collect this certain amount of nuke, you have to go away and do target practice, which is <laughs> obviously lots of fun. And if you fail that, well, you repeat the stage all over again. For whatever reason, you can't just go back on yourself, which is ridiculous in a collecting game like this one. Like, I'm not sure if it's even possible to not have to do target practice at the end of stage one. This game is just so awful, so shittily designed, with such contempt for the poor sodlats playing it, it's horrible. Honestly, one of the worst NES platformers. Do not play this crap. The best thing about it is the title screen, which for whatever reason is Robocop indiscriminately blasting away at nothing in particular. Presumably various criminals are in his sights. Murderers, drug pushers, bank robbers. Oh, and of course, the people who made this game. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all week. Try Laville, and so on. Here's something a bit better for the next one. This game, at least on the NES, is called Castellian and was made by Bits in 1991, but us Europeans likely know it best as Nebulous by Hewson. You take control of a little green cute fin by the name of Pogo, and you've got to make your way up various revolving towers, avoiding obstacles along the way. The sort of computer game that seems simple but is actually pretty difficult a lot of the time is plenty of fun and could be enjoyed on plenty of different platforms. Now this here is one of the more straightforward micro to NES ports, in that I don't think there's much weird going on here. It's just a port of a perfectly decent game that got fairly okay reviews in the bargain. And indeed, as you would expect, this is a totally accurate port of Nebulous, right down to some of the foibles that can make the original a bit annoying at times, such as Pogo's difficulty with stairs, for example. The conversion is perhaps a bit too faithful sometimes, to jump, you have to press the diagonal and A for some reason. You do everything with A, jumping and shooting, whilst the B button kind of just stands idle. Bits must have forgotten about its existence. There's also these simple side-on platform bonus stages that are okay, but in the main, yep, time to go up those towers. I quite enjoy Nebulous, and this is a perfectly good way of playing the game. Not bad going at all from the same folks who bought you classics such as, um... Last Action Hero for the Mega Drive. Still, it's good all the same. Next up is something we've covered a little bit before, but it's certainly yacht. The Last Starfighter. For some, this is a classic bit of 80s nostalgia, especially with the video game connection and all that but you won't find much of that in the actual Last Starfighter video game. Instead, Mindscape, in their infinite wisdom, have taken Graft Gold's old C64 game, Euridium, bunned it on a cart, and for whatever reason, tied it in with this film. There is absolutely no attempt to relate this to the movie in basically any way, aside from the Euridium ship being changed to the ship from the film. So, um, yeah. Now, if you happen to enjoy Euridium, you probably won't find much to dislike here. I can't exactly say it's a bad conversion or anything. It's the same fly around the base, destroy targets and then land dealio. The trouble is, I mean, God, Euridium is so hard. Unforgivingly so. You just end up dying in seconds. I find it really hard to go back to this original, honestly. It's the more famous game, but both the actual sequel, Euridium 2, and its spiritual follow-up, Hyper Sentinel, are much, much better in every way. I mean, they're just so much more balanced and... fun. The original Euridium is more of a game for the uncompromising sadomasochist who really enjoys a bit of pain. And yes, this is also something covered recently, but I can't not mention that Mindscape also took System 3's brilliant myth history in the making, and for whatever reason, they turned it into a rather lame tie-in for Conan the Barbarian. They weren't too big on actually making original games, I guess.
So, some might wonder why the next one actually exists at all. I mean, it's a game on Plateau, the Vietnam film. Not exactly the usual ocean software fare, it has to be said. Now, the answer to this is probably a case of Gary Bracey, as he often did, flying to the States and picking up films at a very early stage. He used to pick up stuff at script stage. Famously, he did that with Robocop. But even if the harrowing nature of Platoon as a war movie isn't something you would think of as being good licensed game material, Ocean still managed to turn it into a hit. And Sunsoft, right at the time when they decided to pivot towards developing great NES games by themselves, happened to publish it on the NES in 1988. Now, to call this game great would be a major stretch, but Platoon isn't bad. It's a very distinctly micro type of game that I would call very short if you know what you're doing. There were only three very different but very mazy levels. The side on affair where you find explosives to blow up a bridge, a first person stage that's in a tunnel, and a top down part that's a little like those fortress stages in Contra. You can very likely beat it in 10 minutes flat, but it takes a fair bit of time to actually get there. The jungle crawls with enemies, particularly those that jump out of trees or come out of the ground, is filled with tripwires that can be tricky to spot and will kill your soldier outright, and the maze is big and complex enough that it may well require you to dust off an old graph paper pad. What really helps the game is a fantastic presentation that you kind of expect from Ocean. The graphics are just full of Atmos. And the music's really good too. We get a fine rendition of Jonathan Dunn's classic C64 chip tune, but there's also extra good music courtesy of Sunsoft's almighty in-house music man, Naoki Kadaka. Some people really don't care much for this game at all, but eh, I like it. It's not Lost Patrol, but it's still good. It might not be all that accurate to the film in the end, but well, I'm not too sure I'd want levels where I go about getting points for killing innocents and burning villagers. Eh, it's just me. Up next, Raffaele Cecco's Almighty Cybernoid. This isn't something we see too often. We've mostly had ports from the C64 so far, but this one can be counted as a NES port from the Spectrum. At least that's where this game originally came from. The port of Cybernoid was done by Studio 12 in 1989, who saw fit to include some amusing jokes, such as the ship being designed by M. Sugden. You know, Molly Sugden. Mrs. Slocum and her pussy. Look, programmers don't really get out all that often, okay? I mean, they were usually stuck in underground dungeons and not allowed to see the public, especially back in the 1980s. What do you expect for them? To be George frickin' Burns? Lay off, okay? Anyway, Cybernoid was a banner title for the old Spectrum in 1987. To its credit, it definitely provided a pretty strong 16 bit esque experience on the Specky. Does it work as well on the NES? Ugh. I mean, it's not an unfaithful conversion. It's still the same flick screen game it ever was. Some people hate it, mind, but then you do have to take this a bit slower than you would other games like it. You need to make use of the ship's full range of weapons, some of which are much better for dealing with certain situations like, say, masses of randomly appearing ships than others. There's also the shield, which comes in quite handy when you're faced with a screen like this that would otherwise require painfully exact flying with a strict time limit. If you hit that select button and learn the tools, you'll have more fun here than you would if you just tried to bash through it. Now, is it worth doing so? Eh, dunno really. Something about this port does feel a teensy bit unfinished, like it could have done with a lot more polish. I rather wish that my personal favourite Checo game, the almighty Exelon, had been given a port to the NES instead. That one's always going to top the class for me. This original game is good too, but this port… yeah, it might not be quite as terrible as some make it out to be, but it is painfully mediocre in the end. Now, speaking of games that could do with a lot more polish, 
we can find a couple more examples of micro to nest ports in the unlicensed game world. The dark corner of the game shop that's filled with studios that had fallen out with Nintendo, thoroughly religious titles, and hooky bootlegs from China. Still, it's not all questionable. There's also Codemasters and their Camerica brand that made inroads in the States. Their biggest success was undoubtedly the Game Genie, the less said about the Aladdin deck enchants the better, and there's a fair few games too. What we're looking at here is the 1993 Quattro Adventure compilation, where we can find not one but two pretty cool micro ports, one of which includes Cody's most famous large vibrating egg. Super Robin Hood, first off, was a pretty important game originally. It stands as the first game that the almighty Oliver Twins had published by Codemasters, and here it's presented in a very nice and somewhat reworked version. Most noticeably, it isn't flip screen anymore. It's still mostly the same aside from that with Robin having to collect all the various treasures around the castle, get keys to unlock other parts of the game and so on. It's a pretty cool little game. Interestingly, we have quite a rare case here, from Micro to NES, and then back to Micro, as this remade version ended up ported to the Specky and C64 as Robin Hood Legend Quest. And also on this cart, we have Treasure Island Dizzy, the second and my own personal favourite Dizzy game, at least outside of Fantastic Dizzy. This is a much more straight ahead port, but the graphics have definitely had a boost up. It's a superb Dizzy adventure. Simple puzzles and coin collecting all the way. You only get one life, although it's not actually that hard a game so long as you actually know what you're doing. It's really good indeed, and both these games certainly make Quattro Adventure worth it. And yes, you can also find BNMX Simulator on Quattro Sports. Not to mention Dizzy Prince of the Oak Folk, which was released on its own as Dizzy the Adventurer. I think it's fair to say that Codemasters did a... an absolutely brilliant job here. <laughs> oh well, back to weirdness and lousiness. It's time for some Target Renegade. This is a confusing mess of a thing that some people might wonder a bit about, so here goes. We start with the original Kunio Kun arcade game by Technos, better known in the West as Renegade. When Ocean secured a license to port the game to UK micros, they also got the rights to make their own sequels in the home. And so they did, which is how we got Target Renegade. And then this ends up on the NES, Ocean developed and published by Taito. These games have nothing in common with the later Kunio Kun games such as, say, River City Ransom. On the spectrum, Target Renegade is about as good a side-scrolling, sort of, beat-em-up that you can get. It's a definite classic there. On the NES? Yeah, it's shit. Everything seems to have gotten another makeover. In fact, our hero seems to look very similar to the brothers Lee from Double Dragon. Here's an interesting fact. In Russia, this game was hacked a bit and actually called Double Dragon 4, leading many who played it over there to think for years that this was an official sequel. None of this makes the actual game interesting. It's as boring as all hell. You would never play this with the likes of TMNT 2 around, or indeed Double Dragon 1 and 2. The enemy types are so unvaried, the controls so awkward. It is no good. There is but one saving grace. Like a lot of CAC NES games, Target Renegade features absolutely incredible music, thanks to the genius that is Tim Follin. And gloriously, in the modern era, you can search that music up on YouTube here, and never have to think about playing the lousy game. Good day! The only other thing I can say I suppose is thank god Renegade 3 didn't get ported to the NES. Don't want to have to spill any invective on that anytime soon. We are winding down a bit now. This is something that I have mentioned before, again, although it was quite a long time ago and I probably ought to do so this time. Good old Super Turrican. It's a very late game indeed, coming out in mid-1993 and then only in Europe. What you have here, rather than a straight conversion of any Turrican game in particular, is a mix of levels from the first two Turrican games. There's not really much to complain about, 
is the exact rock hard toe connection you should be used to with lots of shooting, great music, big levels and lots of secrets, boss battles, power lines and big balls. It's all here basically. And quite awesomely, the whole thing was created by the almighty token creator himself, Manfred Trenz. Trenz did the whole lot on this version of the game. He coded it, he did the graphics, he did the music, it's all him. You don't get too many outright one man jobs on the NES, but this is one of the best of them, and a very solid way indeed of enjoying this classic bit of very European shoot or die action. And finally, well, it's always good to end with the weirdest game of the lot. In many ways this calls back to the initial example I gave of Monty on the One. Somehow a game with that title and the music ended up in Japan thanks to Jalico, although it had almost nothing in common with the original aside from that and thus couldn't really be countered. But it wasn't Jalico's only flirtation with the UK micro classics, and this one is definitely close enough to count. In late 1986, they released a game called Night Law Maju no Ukami Otoko for the Famicom Disk System. Naturally, it's a game that's based on one of the all time classic micro titles, Night Law by Ultimate Play the Game. This is, of course, the original Night Law, the classic isometric adventure that pioneered Ultimate's use of an engine called Filmation, which allowed for much more intricate masking and much better graphics than most were used to on the Spectrum in 1984. Other games of its silk have perhaps held up a lot better than the original Night Law, but it still obviously deserves recognition. This Jalico version most certainly does not deserve recognition, on the other hand. This is um, quite a simple game now. The objects you have to obtain and bring to the wizard are much less fiendishly placed, and well, there's not an awful lot of detail to the graphics, is there? Indeed, the most striking thing about them would be the revolting pea green background that Jalico chose for some reason. That and Saberman now has very big eyes. Clearly, he's caught the anime virus. Poor Finn. This isn't a port of the original as such, we actually have several different levels here. Eight to be precise, and you then have to go through them a second time with invisible items. Good grief, in order to get a proper ending. Needless to say, this gets repetitive and boring long, long before the game reaches its end point. It's not too bad for a little bit and we've definitely seen worse games in this video, but yeah, there's just not too much to this simplified version of Night Law, really. I am curious as to why it exists, although by the time this was made, the ultimate brand was comfortably in the hands of US Gold, who wouldn't have had many problems at all with giving Jalico a license to make this title. It is very much a weird curiosity, perhaps the only true instance of a game going from the ZX Spectrum to the Japanese only Famicom Disk System. Although it is asking far too much for it to actually be a good game, I suppose. And there we are. While a lot of these games were not good, they're certainly curious affairs, and I hope that you've enjoyed having a look at them. I don't think there's too many other games like this on the NES, although if there are any then, well I'm sure they'll be brought up in the comments. Anyway, we've come to the part of the video where all that there's left for me to say is bye for now. So um, bye for now. If you like this video, please do like it, please do have a look at my social media, particularly my Twitter, that's where I'm most active. And also, if you want things like ad-free content, exclusive posts and old wrestling documentaries and new ones in the future, have a look at my Patreon. You could join this list of awesome people here. Alexa Jones Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Andy Cat, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris Conrad Pritchard, D Xalior, Rim One Sutter, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Geordie Alex, Glunfeth, 
Jay is Manchild, James Brown, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligowski, Matthias Gramzov, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Potter Margell, Renby Mon, Rusty Kelly, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tariq Amir, Tim Wald, Yerka Operator, and to all the rest of you guys, my awesome community, my grilled Mormons, as I sometimes call you, thank you so much, and goodbye.